Well, good morning. It's great to be back from vacation and to be with everybody today. And, and I just, again, want to thank Ryan and Nick and, and Steve, the guys that fill in when, when I'm out of town preaching, because I, I just never have a question about what they're going to preach. I just know they're faithful expositors, they're faithful preachers. And, and I raise this because we live in a day and age where we just don't always see that going on around us, do we? In fact, the, over the 2,000 year history of the church, we've seen countless people exchange their pursuit of faithful ministry for man pleasing, self aggrandizement, a ministry that was meant to serve God turned into a self serving pursuit. A ministry in which a minister's greatest fear is the fear of man, not the fear of God. A deep-seated fear that he might face public ridicule and shame for any statement that's out of step with the current cultural narrative. The sad truth of the matter is we see that all the time, don't we? Yet as we turn to our text today, Peter wants us to see that, that, that pastors are not the only ones who face this kind of temptation. They're not. No, every single Christian faces this temptation to blend in to the cultural narrative at hand. In fact, as we dive back into this section on suffering that we've been studying through Peter, It's important to remember that for the most part, Peter's audience in Asia Minor isn't facing threats of physical violence and death for the most part. Might, Might some of them, the answer is yes. But for the most part, that is not the main problem they're facing. No, we actually see it in verse 16 today that these Christians are facing a relentless barrage of verbal attacks, slander, reviling, That's what they're facing now, this barrage of verbal attacks. People around them are trying to to destroy their livelihood, to undermine their place of honor in society, and to utterly dissolve their network of extended relationships in the community at large by defaming their character. And all of this for no other reason than these Christians are trying to live a life that is faithful to Jesus Christ. They're trying to walk in faithful obedience. They're trying, to, they're trying to live in the way that Jesus has called them to. And according to these verses, it appears that these Christians were facing the ever-present temptation to preserve their personal relationships and their social standing by compromising their commitment to their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're being tempted to compromise. And if you think about it, it sounds, it sounds a whole lot like the world in which we live today, isn't it? This world that we live in, that every single Christian faces in American culture as we attempt to navigate this, this verbally destructive, relationally toxic, cancel culture in which we live, where when you say the wrong thing, you're instantly pushed to the outside. See, we have much in common with these believers that Peter is writing to today. So as we turn to our text today, we're not going to identify the main point at the beginning. We're going to identify that as we get to it in the middle, but let's highlight the outline as we go through. Peter Peter breaks up this, this section into three pieces. He begins with a promise for all those who suffer. So he's actually starting with a promise, then he moves to a twofold command, and then he concludes with an important reminder for those who suffer. So let's begin with this promise in verse 13 in the first half of 14, and Peter tells these Christians this, now who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you'll be blessed. Now notice, what's what's the first thing, what's the first thing here in the text that Peter wants us to see about the Christian life in general? General. He wants us to grasp the overarching principle in life that good deeds, usually, we can underline that, 
usually foster good relationships in life and society at large, right? Good deeds are normally repaid by good relationships. In fact, if you think about it, this, this principle is usually true even when people hold different political views and different religious views. We see it happen all the time around us. Go to the Little League field. Is every coach and every parent on the Little League team on the same page politically? No, they're not. And certainly not religiously. But when we take our kids out to Little League, what do we want? We want, we want a coach who, who can coach well, who treats our kids well, loves them, and teaches them baseball. That's what we want. And, and so as a general rule, this is true. Good deeds usually foster good relationships within society at large. And when Peter calls us to be people who are, doing, who are zealous to do good deeds, I think he's actually telling us that Christian, we ought to be the ones who are leading the way in this. We ought to be the ones who are, who are most active in pursuing good deeds in the community at large. We want to be doing good things for the people that are around us. And if that's the case, as a general rule, Christians ought to be the most tolerated, if not the most appreciated people in the local community. Should be. But we know as Peter transitions to the second half of this statement, he acknowledges the fact that the case is not always true, and we already know that. Peter's calling us to be the kind of people who do good not just when we're treated with kindness and respect. We already already saw that two weeks ago. We don't just do good only when people are good to us. Christians are the kind of people that do good when they're in the the face of evil. Christians are the kind of people who do good in the face of hostility and suffering and oppression. That's what Peter's been talking about and he's telling us more about today. But where does this hostility often come from? The hostility often is triggered by the fact that Christians and their surrounding culture do not share the same definition of good and they do not share the same definition of righteousness. Don't miss this, this is, this, is, this is again, one of the places where Peter's letter clearly overlaps with our current cultural moment. Peter's audience is being slandered because they refuse to participate in sinful practices that are valued and celebrated by the community at large. That's why they're being slandered. How do I know that? Well, we can go down to chapter four, starting in verse three. We'll get here in a couple weeks, but this is what Peter says. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they're surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. Did you, did you catch verse four? They look at your life, or they should be looking at your life, and seeing that you do not do the things that they're doing. You do not celebrate what they celebrate. They're surprised, and that surprise drives them to slander and malign and to tear down and to destroy. They can't take it that you don't celebrate what they're celebrating. That's where the slander's coming from. See, don't miss this. There's a kind of good that we hold in common with the world around us, and there's a kind of good that we don't. But the sad truth of the matter is is that our culture doesn't really care about the kind of good that we have in common when Christians refuse to condone the patently sinful social behaviors that God condemns as evil. That's what's underneath this command today. I mean, if you think about it, the world in which we live 
doesn't really have a problem with mealy mouth, namby-pamby, sin-affirming Christians. No, they put them on the evening news. They put them on the talk shows. They want everybody to see them. No, they love that kind of Christianity, and the world constantly holds that up as the highest good. No, the world has a problem and a deep-seated contempt for Christians who refuse to call evil good. That's where this is coming from. The world sees evil and good through one lens and we see it through another because God declares it so in his word. So as we think about this promise of blessing that Peter's talking about, we already saw it two weeks ago, but again, we see it today. He calls, he says, there's blessing. And the blessing that he's calling for here is not the kind of physical health or prosperity that one might expect through the prosperity gospel for doing good works. He, he's pointing us to the fact that nothing in this life, Christian, can harm us. You may, you may be facing all sorts of pressure, even loss of status, job abilities, because of your standing for Christ. But no matter what can happen to you in this life, nothing will ultimately touch what God has promised to hold for you. And that's where Peter began the book. Remember, in verse four and verse five, we have an inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, unfading. God is keeping it, and he's guarding us so that we'll actually make it there and get it. That's the promise. So to put it a different way, it's a promise that every pain we will ever endure in this life is temporary and that we will be vindicated by God himself on the last day. You may never feel vindication in this life. If culture keeps going the direction it's going, (laughs) you're gonna feel more and more and more on the outside. But there is a vindication that comes, and Jesus himself talks about it. Matthew chapter five, starting in verse 10, in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What's the reward? The kingdom of heaven, blessed are you when others revile you, same word that Peter uses, and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. So they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know, I've never heard a prosperity gospel preacher go trace the line of the prophets and see how their ministries normally end. It doesn't fit with the narrative very well. But speaking to us for a moment, there, there's times we struggle to embrace this promise. Any number of things can happen in our life. It makes that harmless promise hard to believe. And as your pastor, I can say there's times in my life where that promise can be hard for me to believe and hold on to and stay grounded in. But there's a quote that I came across a number of years ago by Randy Alcorn from his book, Heaven that brings some wonderful perspective to the difficulty of standing for Jesus in a world that doesn't. He says this, the best of life on earth is a glimpse of heaven. Do you just think the best you could ever think of this earth giving? It's just a glimpse of heaven. The worst of this life. Think of the absolute worst this life could ever possibly be the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. It's just a glimpse. It's just a sliver of what hell will be. He goes on to say, for Christians, this present life is the closest you'll ever get to hell. That's the kind of promise we're holding on to. Christian, the closest you'll ever get to life, hell is this life. But for unbelievers, it's the exact opposite. The closest they'll ever get to heaven is this life. That's that's what's at stake. 
That's what's riding on this. This is the ultimate blessing that Peter's talking about. And we need to grasp this if we're going to be able to, to see and pursue the commands that he lays out for us in the next verses. So let's turn to verses 13, 14 through 16. Knowing this, knowing that the, the best that this world has to offer for someone who, who does not know Christ is the closest they'll get to heaven and the worst this world has to offer is the closest a Christian will ever get to hell. How do we live in light of that? Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor the Christ, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. You know, even though as we're going through this text, the weight of his, these two commands the weight falls on the second, but I want to spend a little bit of time on this first command because it exposes a monumental barrier to Christian obedience. See, on the one hand, in the Christian life, we understand that we have any number of internal barriers, sinful desires that prevent us from following Christ and walking in obedience as we ought. Any number of internal barriers, but on the other hand, Peter's pointing us to the fact that our assurance and stability in this life depends most often on the things that we choose to fear. And some of our greatest fears are the fears that come through other people. We fear that we're gonna be excluded. We fear that we're gonna be made fun of. We, we fear that we're gonna be pushed to the outskirts and, and on the outside edge of society, unwanted outcasts, whether that be in, in, in our neighborhood with a group of friends around us at work. Frankly, we can fear that we might get hurt. All sorts of fear that flows from the fear of man. And here's the thing, these, these threats, they're real. There, there, is, there is truth to them. These things can happen to you. They're real. There's a personal cost that comes with experiencing these. And this is the fear that drives much of our disobedience. And Peter's saying, yes, Christian, these people can cause you to suffer countless ways in your life. Whether it's emotionally, relationally, or physically. But you need to realize that they cannot touch your everlasting joy with Jesus Christ. They can't. Jesus himself, Matthew 10, 28, do not fear those who can kill the body. You know, like, I mean, kind of sounds like a reason to fear. They can kill me. He says, don't fear it, because, because ultimately death in this life is not the end. No, no, fear the one that can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. See, Jesus is telling us that there's a fear we're not supposed to have and a fear we're supposed to have. We're not supposed to have a fear of man. We're supposed to have a rightful fear of God, something that Peter has already called us to in this book in chapter, what, three? And we need that fear the rightful fear if we're gonna fulfill the commands that come. Starting in verse 15, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy. That's the command. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy. Then he tells us more about this, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ might be put to shame. 
No, notice the guiding force in the Christian life is not the fickle whim of human culture or the threats of punishment or isolation that can come at the hands of humans. But Jesus Christ, the one who exercises his rightful, sovereign lordship over all things. Honor Christ the Lord is holy. Honor Christ the Lord. He's Lord over all things. There's, there's no authority higher than Jesus Christ. But it begs a question. What does it look like when Christians honor and fear Christ in their everyday lives as they're called to? What does it look like? Peter doesn't leave us guessing. He tells us what he thinks it should look like. It's two key dispositions. A gospel readiness and a gospel restedness. Honoring Christ the Lord as holy in the midst of unjust suffering and accusations from the world at large. Honoring Christ the Lord as holy looks like two primary things in your life, a gospel readiness and a gospel restedness. A gospel readiness ready to gently and respectively, respectfully share the reasons for your hope and a gospel restedness that shields your heart and mind from the fiery attacks that are wrongfully leveled against you for your commitment to Jesus Christ. So let, let, let's look at this gospel readiness to begin with in verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy. That's the command. So, so what action does it look like? Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. See, Peter knows something about suffering that we often forget. That the malicious gossip and slander and reviling that come from people around us often lead into unexpected inquiries about our faith from the people that are listening. You might be in a group of people and you hear three people attacking while there are another two people listening and watching. He, he knows that there's some people who are going to recognize He's, he's going to recognize the manner in which you and I respond to unjust treatment and unwarranted slander. He's going to notice that we, we don't repay evil for evil and reviling for reviling. And on top of it, they see that the slander is wrongly based. They understand that it's, it's not accurate. Yet in the midst of the group, they're not going to say a word. They're going to stand by. They're going to watch it happen. They don't want to get involved. But what's going to happen, they're going to come up on the side. Private conversation somewhere along the way. And they're going to want to have a conversation. They're going to want to ask some questions. And on account of this, Peter is saying, every single Christian should have a firm grasp of the gospel and be able to explain why you believe the gospel. And when I'm talking about this, I'm not talking about high-level, nerd-level apologetics. Do you understand the message of the gospel? Can you explain why you believe the gospel? Can you answer every question they have? No, but answering for your hope and answering for the gospel. Because why? What has Peter been hammering on us since chapter 2, verse 12? Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. This is honorable conduct. What's the purpose of this honorable conduct? So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. What's he telling us about here in this section that we're in? That seeing those good deeds requires words. They're going to see good deeds. They're going to ask questions. And when they ask questions, we're going to actually share the gospel with them. Because your good deeds, apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, will not bring a single person into the kingdom of heaven. The gospel is words. 
So I want to press on a point of application here before we move on. I want to ask a question. Christian, are you able to articulate, reasonably articulate, not perfectly articulate, reasonably articulate, the truths of the gospel and the reasons you believe without using the kind of insider jargon that we use in the church? Because often we share it in ways that people on the outside don't understand. They don't know the words. They don't know the definitions. They're, they're left trying to fill in the blank and define them as we go along. You know, it's like you ever talk to somebody that like, works in the shipyard or they work in the Navy and they start using acronyms for everything. That's where it goes. Is there any hope? I mean, that's, that's just catastrophic. Is there any hope? And, and that, at that place we can say, well, I'm glad you asked. See, because the truth of the matter is, is that God should have left every single one of us to our sin. He should have consigned the entire human race to eternity in hell, but he didn't. Now he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ. Lived a perfect life fulfilled every command that he, he had to be fulfilled, and then he died as a substitute to pay for our sin. That, that's why Jesus came. And then God raised him from the dead to show him it's all true. Everything he said is true, and he, he was wrongfully put to death, and as a result also we have a promise of resurrection with Jesus. At that point, they might ask, well, that's great. Does Jesus' death mean that everybody's forgiven? Our answer is, well, not exactly. God has promised that everyone who turns from their life of sin and embraces Jesus as their only hope of forgiveness will be forgiven and be saved and enjoy a right relationship with him. There's a condition. It has to be received. And for those who receive it, they will be saved from God's wrath in the lake of fire and enjoy everlasting happiness for all of eternity with God. See, here's the truth of the matter. Everybody lives forever. Everybody lives forever. The question is where? This is why Christians live the way they do, and this is where our hope is anchored. Would you like to become a Christian too? you can have the same hope. You can have the same promise. Christian, how far can you get with the gospel? How far can you get? Let me press even farther. Are you more equipped today I want you to assess yourself honestly. Are you more equipped today to explain your positions on constitutional law, critical race theory, immigration policy, mask wearing, and gun rights than you are equipped to explain the gospel? And I'm not trying to say these issues are irrelevant. My point is for most of you, it took you countless hours listening to radio shows, watching TV programs, reading articles, consuming all sorts of media to come up with your answers to those questions and to have a clear position and to be able to define it and defend it when somebody else asks. What kind of impact would the church have if Christians put that same amount of time into being able to defend the gospel, describe the gospel, explain the gospel? 
See, most of the time our inability isn't the fact that we don't know anything, it's that we've never taken the time to pursue it to the degrees of things that we believe are more important than it. There's one hope that transcends every single one of these issues. And it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's a hope that enables us to find gospel rest. So we have a gospel readiness, but it also gives us a gospel rest as we're anchored in what God has done for us in Jesus Christ and the promises that he has. 1 Peter 3, 16, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. You know, as we've already seen, why are these slanderous attacks coming against these Christians? Why do they come against most Christians today? They're they're usually motivated by the fact that the very standard of good and righteousness that God reveals to us in his word and the standard by which Christians are called to live their lives every single day in this world are in direct conflict with the culture in which we live. That's where the accusations are coming from. Why do faithful Christians reject premarital sex and extramarital sex and homosexual sex and transgenderism? Not because we've decided that we know everything. We do reject it because God does in his word. See, we we, we don't reject these things out of a personal hatred for people. We reject them because we are utterly convinced that human beings do not have the right to define the nature of love and the rightful parameters of sexual practice by popular vote or Supreme Court judgment. God does. That's why we hold what we hold and we believe what we believe. And the unbelieving world is on the constant attack one way or another. I I mean, the the attacks are going on through music and media outlets and authors and movies and politicians. Every manner of attack is out there, even if you don't have it directly against you. And the attack is aimed at a specific goal. They want to convince you that you're the source of the problem. They want to convince you that you're the problem. They want to convince Christians that we're unrighteous, hateful bigots because we do not support and embrace and embrace everyone's pursuit of personal happiness and fulfillment in life as the way each person defines it. Yet in this, what are they trying to do? They're trying to recalibrate your conscience. the onslaught of everything going on is to recalibrate your conscience. Conscience, basically this, your consciousness of what is right and what is wrong. Your conscience can be wrong. And they're, and they're, trying, to, they're, trying, to, they're trying to recalibrate it so you start calling evil good and good evil. They're trying to convince us that righteousness is wicked. And, and, and this is why a good conscience before the Lord is so important. When we can stand before the Lord with a true, clear conscience, we're able to withstand the most withering attacks, whether it's from the world or whether it's coming from our family on the inside. Because we know who we represent. See, that's what a good conscience before the Lord does. It helps us withstand the withering attacks that come against us. It reminds us that the world's opinion is worthless. It's worthless and it's weightless. 
it's weightless. If we truly grasp the infinite satisfaction and happiness that come from our hope in Jesus Christ. There's no, there's no way to measure infiniteness against finiteness. The problem is, is we live all of our life in this finite world. See, the truth of the matter is, Christian, at any given moment, we might stand before men ashamed. We might stand before men condemned. Yet their judgment does not matter if we were standing rightly before the Lord. See, Peter's main idea in the text is this. Suffering Christians honor Christ when they share their gospel hope instead of cowering before their human oppressors. He's calling us not to cower. Yet it's not the kind of, we often think not cowering means bravado and arrogance and fighting back, but he already told us we're not repaying evil for evil. That was two weeks ago. It's making sure that the gospel is at the heart of everything we do. And when we do disagree, and when we are getting condemned, it's for the gospel. Not for our petty little fights about other things. And to make sure that his readers truly understand this call to suffer for righteousness sake, he concludes with an important reminder. And it's our conclusion this morning, but this reminder has two important things for us. It has a fundamental truth, and and it has a theological qualification. So let's go to verse 17. So Peter closes off this section and says, it's better to suffer for doing good. If that should be God's will, then for doing evil. So the fundamental truth, I like what Tom Schreiner points out in his commentary on 1 Peter. He says this, he says, Peter knew human nature. He realized that some Christians might be tempted to act like every experience of suffering in their life was an indication of their personal righteousness. We're humans, right? And and we're still we're we're still struggling with our indwelt sin, and we are easily so easily to take this these passages and say every bit of suffering is because I'm just being righteous. Righteous. Like he's saying, no, no, not the case. No, he says no. Often the case is is that people are suffering the direct consequence of their sinful actions. So we need to make sure which it is. We don't, don't suffer for stupid stuff. We see this all the time. People acting like religious martyrs when they're just getting their just desserts. And it's my hope that this passage today will help you and help us as a church navigate these questions when they arise. They're not always easy. They take a lot of work, but we want to make sure that if we're suffering, it is for doing good, gospel good, for God's glory with Christ as Lord. We never want to whitewash Christian sin with the gospel. Because when it comes down to it, suffering for sinful actions does not magnify the infinite worth of Jesus Christ. It does not bring honor to God. And for the person suffering, it's really a stupid waste of time. Because the kind of suffering that honors God is the kind of suffering that flows from a person's faithful obedience to God himself. That's what Peter wants us to see. So finally, the theological qualification. There's something we need to know about suffering when it comes, Christian. 
When suffering comes, it's not a sign that Satan has got the upper hand. It's not a sign that God has lost control. It's not a sign that God is not fulfilling his promises to you. Because what does he tell us in the text? If suffering comes as a result of God's will, if it's gonna come into your life, it's going to come through the hands of God first. See, he wants this group of believers in Asia Minor and he wants us to know today that if suffering comes our way, it's within God's will for our life. It's within his will. And if suffering is in God's will, it is being graciously guided and guarded by his sovereign hand, even when it doesn't feel like it is. He's ruling over all things. And here's the payoff. It ultimately means that no one no one, no, no person, no nation, no demon, not even Satan himself can touch God's children apart from his express permission. That's what Peter wants his people to know. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, as we as we conclude this morning, God, what can we say to these things? But if you are for us, who can be against us? God, if you didn't spare your own son, but you gave him up for us all, how will you not also with him graciously give us all things? Time and time again throughout your word, you, you, you remind us that you are the one who justifies. And, and at the same time, we have the promise that our Lord Jesus Christ is interceding for us right now at your right hand. Yes, God, we confess that the things that are going on in this world can consume us and we lose track and we feel like we need to take matters into our own hand. Help us know how to walk these difficult paths when they come. Help us be a people who, who know the gospel, can share the gospel. And God, that in our actions, we do not demean your gospel. Father, we thank you for the promise that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. Nothing. You've told us whether those things be persecution or tribulation or distress or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. But in all these things, you've said we're conquerors through you who loved us. Therefore, we have this confidence and increase this confidence among your people that nothing, not death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation is able to separate us from your love in Jesus Christ our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.